Thank you very much. Um, I'm very happy to be here. It's my first time in India, um, but I have to admit I'm feeling a bit sad now because it's the last day. <laughs> I'm glad that you thanked everyone, by the way, because I thought I had to, and it, it seemed like quite a lot of names. So, <laughs> Okay, so let me begin by writing out a plan of what I want to do today. So first thing, is I want to recall the curve. So of course this is due to five Fontaine. So why do I want to recall the curve? Um, if I start the expose or the, the lecture with let X be the Fog Fontaine curve, I feel like I'm committing crime. So um, yeah, to uh, make my life easier, it's more of a recall for me. Uh, secondly, as the title suggests, once I have the curve, I want to recall Fog's conjecture. So roughly, what does fast conjecture say? Well, this uses the geometry of the curve. To encode uh, the local Langlands correspondence. Uh, okay, so just as in the geometric Klanglin story, a la Gates, Gorey, and company, there is a, a stack of G bundles appearing, so bung G, and there is also a Hecker stack. Both of these objects I will define later, and they will require the so-called relative Fontaine curve. And finally, once I established the, once I've written down the conjecture, I want to specialize, specialize to the GL2 case. Where we can do some explicit calculations. So this will involve kind of two parts. So the first part is a study of, say, compactly supported cohomology uh, of the semi-stable part of the Hecker stack. So this will be very closely related to non-abelian Leuven-Tate theory. Okay. Um, and analogously, uh, I want to do the same thing, but on the non-semi-stable part and uh, that will be related to the so-called harris veeman conjecture. So the harris veeman conjecture, roughly, it states that the cohomology of a non-basic Rapport zinc space is parabolically induced. 
So once I you know, have those two things there, I want to prove as an application, so I want to show that with time permitting, the so-called Hecker eigensheaf property of Fox's conjecture. For a cuspidal Langlands parameter and a minuscule co-character. Okay, so let me get started on a quick recall of the Fagfontaine curve as best as I can. Uh, let's go here. So some notation, I won't introduce too much. So E will be a finite extension of QP. Um, uh, FQ will be my residue field after I fix some uniformizer pi. Um, my category of test objects will be perfectoid spaces over FQ. So just perfect spaces. <clears throat> of course, there will be some nice topology um, that I will equip with this every now and again, something like the pro tau topology or the V topology, but we can let that slide for now. So S will be my test object, and it will always be affinoid. And I will fix a pseudo uniformizer pi of r. Okay, so section one, five point ten curve. So as far as I understand, uh, the motivation for such a <coughs> for such a guy was to geometrize, let me go here, geometrize so-called B pairs. So what is a B pair? So this is an isomorphism between a certain type of crystalline cohomology and Duram cohomology. So crystalline cohomology in this setup is some kind of BE module. So BE, as has been introduced earlier on, is the fine variance of B Chris. And Duram cohomology is some B plus Durem module. And now we want to view these guys as <coughs> vector bundles. So you want to see these B pairs <coughs> as vector bundles on some curve. So let's call it X. Now, the punchline which allows us to do this is the fact that BE here is a PID. It's not an obvious fact. Uh, and because it's a PID, we can think of Boville-Laszlo gluing. And uh, if we want such a setup, then X should be, or one possible candidate, 
could be <coughs> so some punctured disk with ring of functions BE together with some point at infinity, which allows us to glue, you know, extend vector bundles a priori on this punctured disk to the whole curve. So for that, for this, for this uh, to happen, we should specify that the completed stalk at this point is B plus Duran. And that's it. Uh, that's one version of the curve. <coughs> However, uh, we can go a bit more further. We see that BE here is some fine variance of a bigger ring. So perhaps there is some larger covering space Y lying above X. Um, so what is Y? Well, one possible candidate, as a first guess, I guess, at least, is to take Y as spec of B Chris, or something similar, but this would be kind of a sin because phi is not an automorphism on B Chris. So this is how this ring A inf gets introduced. It's a smaller ring than B Chris, but phi is an automorphism on it. So this A inf, which is the ring of width vectors of O C P flat. So what are the what is a typical element in this ring? Well, it's a power series in pi k, in pi. These xk's here are in O C P flat. And how does phi act on it? As I said, I mean, A inf is contained in B Chris, so what does phi do to it? Well, it raises the coefficients by a power of p. And let me at this point switch to the rigid setup. Um, so we can take y to be spar of A inf. And since we are interested in the, you know, p adic datum, originally the goal was to keep track of various cohomology, I want to remove the points where this cohomologies degenerate. So that's exactly where, well, p or pi, I think, I'll just use pi here then. Pi and the Tesh Muller lift vanish. Okay. And of course, the, to write this out properly, one needs to put a certain topology on A inf. I just want to briefly mention at this point that it's okay to question out by phi. So there's this diagram that Kedlea drew, which represents Y, where we're removing three points. There's a non-analytic point here, and points where the residue kind of vanishes along P equals zero axis, and Teshmuller lift equals zero. And along here, by comparing the valuations of P and the Teshmuller lift, uh, there is some radius function, kappa, and proving that the radius function is, behaves appropriately shows that phi acts properly discontinuously, or in other words, as nice as possible on y. So with this setup, we can define x, at least in the rigid setting, as the quotient of, of y. One reason why I switched to the rigid setting over there is 
I mean, I'm not sure whether this covering space exists in the scheme setup as we are really using, you know, this rigid properties to prove that kappa is well defined or what behaves well. Okay, so now I want to start building the relative Fagfontein curve. Um, and I think the most direct way to do this is to reinterpret X as a modular space of certain untilts. So the precise statement is as follows. So theorem due to Fag Fontaine which I just abbreviate to FF. So on the, one, on the one hand, I'm interested in, say, characteristic zero and tilts of CP flat. And this is in bijection with the closed points of X of course, up to Frobenius. Now, let me try to, you know, rewrite this as a functor of points and try to upgrade it. So, if I was to try to do this, I could try to do something like, like this. Um, let's just temporarily introduce a functor of points. Let's call it spa of QP um, untilts. And this functor of points for every test object gives me its untilts with a morphism to QP, which means, in other words, that it's a characteristic zero untilt. And uh, since I'm interested in untilts over CP flat, I want to maybe tend to take the product with just viewed as a functor of points of spa CP flat. And there's a Frobenius here, so I want to quotient out by the Frobenius on CP flat. And, you know, this is just an upgraded version of the previous theorem as a functor of points. Of course, you know, due to the recent work of Schultze, um, we now know that this functor of points here is very well behaved. In particular, it's an analog of some algebraic sheaf in, this, in the rigid setting, an algebraic sheaf. You know, there's, an, there's a notion of algebraic sheaves for schemes and for the etale topology. And if one equips the category perf, FQ, with an appropriate topology, then <coughs> this happens to be quite a nice sheaf, in particular, some analog of an algebraic sheaf for this topology. So because of that, in literature now, this is usually written with diamond. But as you can see, a priori, it's, it's not such a scary thing. Uh, okay, and why have I done that? Well, from this, it's very easy to kind of uh, introduce the relative Fagfontein curve. So if I want to fiber it over my S, then this is just going to be S times my untilts with, equipped with the structure morphism to E, questioned out by the Frobenius of S. Okay, so now we have the relative Fagfontein curve. I want to just very quickly, um, I mean, at some point, vector bundles will become very important, so I, may, I would like to rewrite my schematic version of the scheme in a very, in a kind of a, more convenient way to work with vector bundles. So I have my Ys here. Let's call this Ys. And if I take global sections 
of Ys. This is some kind of big ring where power series are allowed to in pi in both directions, positive and negative powers. And if I want to form a graded ring, it's natural to take phi equals pi d components and then take the proj of this. So this will be my x, say, r scheme. OK? Um, and just one final sanity check, because I have been saying that this is some kind of curve. Well, um, of indeed, x, say, with uh, s equals cp flat is uh, integral noetherian regular curve um, over spec of qp, say. And the morphism is not of finite type. And it's due to this reason that the theory kind of differs from some techniques in geometric Langlands where one starts off with a projective smooth curve, usually a finite time over some finite field, say. Okay, so I said that Fark's conjecture is trying to geometrize local Langlands. So how does the Fark Fontaine curve see groups like GQP, which are uh, you know, very important in, in local Langlands correspondence. Well, they are seen through the automorphisms of vector bundles on the Fark Fontaine curve. So I need to talk about vector bundles. Uh, and the first kind of starting point for this is Gaga. And I just want to mention that, I mean, So vector bundles over the schematic curve are in correspondence with vector bundles on the attic curve. So the reason why I say this is the starting point is because in the local language correspondence, kind of a typical space that appears is the Lubin Tate Tower, which is a deformation of Rapport. Oh, which is a deformation of p-divisible, a moduli space of deformations of p-divisible groups. And a deformation of p-divisible groups corresponds to a modification of vector bundles. So singularities of where these two, mod two vector bundles differ are very important, in particular studying the residue fields um, becomes important. However, on the attic curve, residue fields are not well behaved. So it's important that we have this kind of, this correspondence, which allows us to work with vector bundles in the scheme setting, which is much more convenient when studying modifications. Okay. Let me give some examples of vector bundles. So I have my graded ring over here, which I call P. <clears throat> so of course I can translate by uh, integer shifts. And due to the isocrystal nature of this Frobenius, I can also divide. So if I take some etal cover of my curve, so for example, of degree h, I question out by powers of phi h. Then I can form kind of rational twists by pushing forward. Uh, integer twists along this Galois cover. 
it would also be, I mean, as far as I know, um, I don't know any ramified cover of the Fagfontein curve. And I think it would be interesting to at least construct one. Uh, maybe if someone knows, someone can tell me. But um, yeah, as far as I know, the only covers I know are, you know, it's our covers, finite it's our covers. So because uh, the curve is not a finite type uh, over spec QP, it means that it's going to be difficult to talk about, say, the degree of a vector bundle. Um, but this is possible. So why do we need to do that? Well, in the proof of the local language correspondence, it's important to separate the super singular locus from the ordinary locus. And how does super singularity get interpreted in this setup, well, it's via the language of semi-stability of vector bundles. So we need some notion of slope, and in particular, the degree of a point. Um, so it's not obvious that this can be done, but it can. So Fog Fontaine plus Ked layer. So first of all, there exists a good degree function on the closed points. And secondly, the stable vector bundles. And once one has a degree, one can define the notion of slope are of the form of lambda, where lambda is some rational. And one can ask, just as in the case of the projective line, whether that's kind of all the vector bundles, maybe some direct sums, and this is indeed the case. So the Hardin-Arisman filtration splits. So every vector bundle is of the form just the direct sum of these rational twists. OK? And I've been saying this word modification, so maybe I should just give a quick example um, what I mean by that. So example of modification, well, for example, if I take the trivial line bundle and inject it into the rational twist by one, this is an isomorphism over this punctured Fagfontaine curve, so spec of BE. And away from that, there is some skyscraper sheaf where there's some singularity at infinity. So this is what I mean by modification. Of course, also, when one takes global sections of this situation, we, we get the fundamental exact sequence of pierre de Koch theory. So it's another instance why vector bundles are important. OK, so I can now head on to stating the Fox conjecture. OK. So the first object that I want to consider is the stack of G bundles. So definition, bung G, of course, from now on, we can just think of for G equals GL2. This is a functor from perf FQ to groupoids. And it sends a test object, S, to G bundles on the relative Fagfontein curve. XS. So let's have a look what Bung GL2 looks like. So far away, 
Um, G here is um, any connected reductive group over E. Um, so far away, Bung GL2 looks like Z components of the positive real number line. And uh, if I zoom in to one of these components, let's say this one here, then I get a, a very generic point, say O of two, which specializes to O of one plus O of minus one, which further specializes to O of two plus O of minus two, and so on. If I zoom into I connect another connected component next to it, I get O over half. And this specializes to O of 1 plus O, etc. And up here I have O of minus a half, and so on. So along here, I have my connect components, so parameterized by the degree of my rank two vector bundle. And along here, my specializations are controlled by Newton polygons. So as you can see, this kind of picture looks like some kind of something close to isocrystals. So I'm wondering maybe from today, today's morning talk by Arban and Jim whether there would be some relationship with vector bundles and jet spaces. Um, <clears throat> right, so at this point I want to kind of um, uh, talk about automorphism group of vector bundles. That's how we're going to see our, for example, supercuspidal representations of GL2QP. Um, but I also want to emphasize that how the Fark Fontaine curve sees inner forms of G. And I think for this, uh, uh, it might be best if I uh, work with this Kotwit set BG. It's just some isocrystals equipped with some G structure. And uh, so in general, there is some bijection between this and bung G over FQ bar. It's important to work over FQ bar here because you know, we are talking about isocrystals. Um, so I hope this, is, this kind of bijection is evident from the picture here for the GL2 case. Um, but it's uh, the Kotwit set, and it's uh, sigma conjugations of this, uh, the E brev rational points of G. But it's related to some isocrystal set equipped with G structure. But of course, for GL2, I mean, it's, you don't really need to worry about it. Uh, so if I pick some B in here, which is meant to be, represent some vector bundle, so, I mean, some G bundle, so, don't worry about this set BG too much, but every time I, I have an element in there, just think of I'm picking out a vector bundle, um, and the vector bundle looks like EB, XS. So one definition of it is as a tensor functor, well, it goes from the category rep G, finite dimensional representations of G, to isocrystals of E brev and to vector bundles 
on the curve, so vector bundles, and it's just a tensor, tensor definition where some representation gets sent at the usual functor, so I tensor this to E brev, and I twist by the action of B and sigma, and this functor here, D phi, I send an isocrystal to the vector bundle associated with its geometric realization. So this is Y times D quotient out by phi to Y over phi. Okay, so I want to, I mean, for some, uh, this automorphism group of the first functor is J, B, constant group, JBE, while this functor here, so is JB tilled, so I'll go on to the next board here. So JB tilled will be some functor from perf FQ bar to groupoids, which sends S to the automorphism group of EB XS. And it's clear from the way that I've defined EB that this contains JB tilde, uh, JBE underline. So the key point. Uh, to so that we see the local Langlands correspondence is the following. So for B in BG with, uh, say, whose Newton polygon has no break points, the JB tilde is exactly the rational points of JB. So if we go back to the diagram that I drew here in the GL2 case, the automorphism group of O2 Automorphism group of this guy is GL2QP. And the automorphism group of O over half is the units of the quaternion algebra with Hassan variant a half. So we see that there's a possibility of obtaining the local Langlands correspondence and Jacquet Langlands at the same time. Similarly, if I continue down the chain, the automorphism group of, of 1 of 2, well, it's just shifted by O of 1 of this guy, so it's the same as GL2QP. And for O of minus a half, it, it's again this quaternion algebra. For GLN, we would see all the other inner forms of GLN appearing. Okay, so now I want to introduce the Hecker stack. So the Hecker stack is just the stack of modifications. Sorry, I'm not going to give the general definition, just work in the case that I need to. So, as a, if I take my test affinoid, a 
it gives me spits out. So two vector bundles, E and E prime over XS. Say scheme this time because I want to talk about modifications and it's easier to do that on X scheme. Together with some degree one count degree one Cartier divisor, where E and E prime differ, and some modification, so, so this is some isomorphism away from D. Okay, so one final thing that I need to do to before I state fast conjecture, I want to, I need to have some diagram of modifications. So on the one hand, I have my Hecker stack. I have a point in my Hecker stack. So E, E prime together with the singularity, so D, and the modification F. On the one hand, I can project it down to the stack of G bundles simply by sending this quadruple to E. And on the other hand, I can send it to Bung G together and keep track of the Caltier divisor. So here, I want to send it to E prime D. And I want to label these arrows by H over right arrow, left right to the left, and this one to the right. So now I have enough to state fast conjecture. So given some cuspidal Langlands parameter, L parameter, so cuspidal. I should be able to associate it with some nice QL bar vial sheaf on Bung G. I don't really want to talk about the vial part in this lecture, but just think of it as a QL bar sheaf on Bung G. FQ bar with the following properties. So the starting point is I have a L parameter and the idea is to associate it to construct a some kind of sheaf F phi living here. So what are the properties that it should satisfy? Well, one, since I started with a cuspidal L parameter, I want that the support of F phi lives in the semi-stable part. This is not so surprising because, or not unreasonable to ask, because the semi-stable part is, is where, is synonymous with the super singular locus. Um, so just to recall, the semi-stable locus for Bung GL2 is quite simple. I mean, it was just a disjoint union of points, right? I mean, we had O of two in one connected component. It was the, there were many other points in this connected component, for example, O of one plus O of minus one, and so on. Uh, maybe O of two plus O of minus two, and et cetera. But all of these are, non, are not semi-stable. So we're just left with O of two. Similarly, in the, the net connected component next door, we are just left with one point, O of minus a half. And similarly, O of half here, and O of one, two here, and et cetera. So the semi-stable locus in Bung GL2 is quite simple. It's just a disjoint union of points. And we're asking that the support of F5 lives on these points. 
So we want to now specify what F phi is restricted to each of these points are. So F phi restricted to, let's say, this stack here. I'm going to call it, just keep labeling it by O of 2. Well, this should be the representation of GL2QP given by the local Langlands correspondence. And I want to make it kind of sheafy. Uh, this kind of makes sense because this point stack O of 2 by the automorphism theorem over there, it's just some point stack with automorphism given by GL2QP. So if I have some representation of GL2QP, there is a natural way to associate some sheaf to it. And on the component next door, say O over half, I want Fi restricted to O over half to be the Jackie Langlands, uh, the representation of the quaternion algebra, the units of the quaternion algebra with Hass invariant a half given by the Jackie Langlands correspondence. This again is not makes sense because, as I stated earlier, O over half is just a point stack with automorphism group D of half. So once I specify these two conditions, this describes F phi completely along all the other connected components. I mean, O over 2, there's nothing happening with uh, no new automorphism group appearing in O of 1. So once I specify this, I've actually defined F phi completely. So at, as of now, there's not much to prove. But there is one more condition that, well, their equalities of, I mean, I'm trying to construct some QL bar sheaf on bung G. So I have some representation of GL2QP. And uh, there is kind of a nice way to make a sheaf out of it, a QL bar sheaf, on this connected component, on this point here, because it's just a point stack with group GL2QP. And similarly for the a half. So that's why I just put underline to mean that it's the sheaf associated to it. So at the moment, I haven't done anything. I've just construct, I've just given a definition of F phi. And the following property should be satisfied. So if I pull back so three, if I pull back uh, F phi along H over left arrow, and I take compactly supported cohomology, then this should give back F phi. Well, not quite because there's a div one X and I'm just going to write some, well, div1x, uh, you can make a, the L parameter phi as a sheaf over it. But essentially, I kind of want to ignore this for now. But the property that one wants is that F phi is kind of invariant under this modification diagram. So what do we need to prove? So for the remainder of the lecture, I tried to give some ideas of this. So proof. So on the one hand, I have this sheaf here. My modified sheaf, let's say. I can restrict it to the O2 uh, point, and that should give back F phi. So it should be, by the construction of F phi, the local Langlands 
uh, GL2QP representation associated to phi. And that's one point. The second point is if I take this sheaf again and restrict it to over half, then I should get back Jackie Langlands. And finally, if I take this sheaf, seeing as Fi had support only on the semi-stable locus, the support of this thing should also be contained in the semi-stable part. Now, to prove these two properties here, um, one needs to do some massaging and uh, kind of uh, from the HECA diagram that I just rubbed out, unfortunately, uh, HECA to Bung G times div one x to div one x to bung g. And one needs to do some massaging and realize some Lubin Tate tower, which appears once I take some pullback of points from this diagram. Uh, and then these equalities follow from the local language correspondence for GL2 QP. So I just want to talk about maybe how to prove this fact here. So I want to show that the support of this sheaf is contained in the semi-stable locus here. So one can first ask, so first question to prove this. So is the pullback, so this is over left arrow, over right arrow, is the pullback or the inverse image of the semi-stable locus contained in the inverse image of the semi-stable locus from over right arrow? So if this is true, then this is trivial. But, so in other words, what I'm asking is, if I have some modification of some um, non-semi-stable vector bundle with, by a semi-stable vector bundle, so is this kind of diagram possible? And the answer is yes. So one just needs to think of the modification that I wrote down earlier on by O of O of 1 and just adding O of 1 to both sides. So as you can see, this guy is semi-stable and this is not semi-stable. So definitely we don't have this property. However, the situation is, can only get this bad. So in particular, we have the following fact. So lemma, if I have such a situation, so if I have a, a modification by E, e prime oh, with, a point, with some singularity at just one point, say, at infinity. And this is not semi-stable. And this guy is semi-stable. Well, then there are not so many choices. E has to be of the form 
O of m minus 1 plus O of m and E prime has to be of the form O of m plus O of m. So this, this can be proved using the classification theorem of, of vector bundles on the Fagfontein curve. And the key point is the following. Yes, yes. So if I have, yeah, a diagram like this. So there are not so many possibilities for how bad the situation can be away from the semi-stable locus. And the key point is that this kind of triple O of m minus 1 plus O of m to O of m plus O of m. And of course, the thank you for the previous question, the minuscule co-character. Okay. In this case, kind of 1, 0. But this triple is uh, somehow Hodge-Newton reducible. So very quickly, what does this mean? Well, um, in terms of Newton polygons, I think it's just best to give an example. So where, and a non-example. So in the case for GL4, um, the following is kind of HN reducible, half uh, a Newton polygon with slopes half, half, and then zero, zero, then just one, then followed by one, zero, zero, zero. The point is that the difference of the Newton polygons in the first and second coordinate touch this polygon at least, well, at the edge points and again once in the middle. Maybe a non-example, in the case for GL5, would be half, half, one third, one third, one third, then again one, and say one, one, zero, zero, zero. Um, so let me just finish by writing down what the geometric uh, proposition that we need to prove. So the proposition is as follows. So if I have some B, B prime and mu, so these are my two vector bundles, and if uh, the Newton polygon of, say, B, B prime, B minus B prime, uh, together with plus the Hodge polygon mu uh, touch at least three times, then I have the following situation. So if I have some modification of EB, say, away from D, EB prime, then the statement is there exists some P reduction. So, yeah, the, I also have to assume that B, so B, B prime are in BG, and they come from some proper Levy subgroup BL, say B naught and B naught prime. 
and there is also a parabolic associated with it. And the statement is there is a P reduction of F, so F of P, so EP to EP prime, such that EP has trivial unipotent part. So it comes from this EB naught, which is a priori an L torsor or an L bundle to P. And similarly for EP prime, EB naught prime times L of P. So um, I should stop here. Yeah, so uh, mm -hmm. um, well, because the automorphism groups of these vector bundles are precisely the rational points of maybe the group G, then you know you have a chance of getting some. I mean, it means that, um, say, for example, of O of two. It's a, it's a point stack, so some classifying stack, with GL2 QP group. And so if I have some representation of GL2 QP, I can kind of make some uh, sheaf on this point stack very naturally. Um, so in this way, I mean, the, the, the miracle is that Automorphism groups of vector bundles are precisely rational points of groups, which is not what happens in the geometric Langland setting. They're just the algebraic group completely. And so in this way, we have a chance of uh, mm, capturing representations of GL2QP or D half cross. Um. Any more questions? If not, let's thank you very much. <clears throat>